It's not growing with high inflation and still with deficit, because there are countries with, with higher deficits than Ethiopia, which are not growing. So I keep telling my students, if somebody tells you a country has high deficits, ask them, what's in the deficit? High expenditures. What's in the expenditures? Are they just buying four by four luxury cars for the ministers? That's a problem. If they are building bridges, that's a different story. And in this case, it's more bridges than luxury cars. Um, the, uh, the, the government has been quite clever in finding ways to, to finance the government, uh, the government deficit because in the Law, there are restrictions to how much the government can, the, the central government can borrow directly from the central banks. Direct financing from the central banks is meant for a fraction of the country, I don't know the number. But they found a way to do it, in the sense that rather than the central bank, the central, the, the central government borrowing, they actually have the state owned enterprises borrow. And they do the job of the government. So if you go just by the books, you'll say, oh, they are fine because of the advances from the government, from the central bank, but they take a detour and have the, uh, the uh, electricity company, the petrol company, and all kinds of the, the petrol enterprises, all directly from uh, either the central bank or the uh, Ethiopian Commercial Bank. It's called Ethiopian Commercial Bank. It's a public, uh, public bank, which it does most of the financing of state owned enterprises, strategic, strategic sector. Another, from an external side, they have experienced uh, large fiscal and large trade deficits and really chronic shortage of foreign exchange. And that has been an issue because as the government wants to, to boost uh, growth, they have to import equipment, but exports are not, are not picking, they are, they are keeping pace of, of, uh, of, in, of uh, exports are not keeping pace of imports. So that drives the, the, the trade deficit, but also uh, draws on the country's foreign exchange. And they have tried to manage that with uh, strictly regulating the foreign exchange, uh, the exchange rate, which is fixed many for, for many, many, many years. So in practice, that means that the foreign the currency is overvalued for, for, for several periods, and that undermines the exports, as it, uh, encourages imports, and that's, that's a big issue. Um, so this is uh, shows the fiscal deficit that they have. Uh, they have not been able to keep it under the target, uh, given the, the, the white the white target. Um, this is what I was talking about when uh, when you look at the allocation of credit domestically. You can see that um, the, if you look at the blue line, that's that's followed by the central government. Yeah. People tell the government, no, no, don't watch your borrowing because it's bad for inflation, it's bad for the fiscal. Yeah, we'll do that. Don't worry, we're not borrowing, okay? But then you look at the SOEs, they're borrowing a lot. So, and if you look at the private sector, they haven't grown much, any. So, that's a different, that's a, not your standard story of crowding out where people look at central government versus private sector. No, in that, in the case of Ethiopia, it's better to think about the public sector, central, uh, central government, and uh, and, and uh, state owned enterprises. In fact, that's what we do in our, in our analysis. Uh, this is on the external, external trade side, um, deepening trade deficits, and uh, and uh, on the export exchange side, you can, yeah. This, this shows you the official exchange rate versus the parallel exchange, exchange rate market. So the official exchange rate, you can see they keep it very, very uh, fixed, and then, but, but then it has a huge gap between the official and the, the parallel market because people can't get the money from the banks, they have to go to the, to the bank. Um, so a quick review which channels. Zoom through very quickly. Uh, one of the reasons for caring about inflation is that it has direct implications on, on the world. 
And in the case of Ethiopia, there has been very good studies based on micro data, survey data that shows, first of all, that the impact is significant, but also it's actually disproportionately affecting the poor uh, relative to the rich, the urban, the urban elite. So it has distribution effects. Um, we, in our examination of the, of the data, it became clear that uh, if you want to, to analyze inflation, you have to, to look at what goes into the basket of this CPI uh, that we, we normally take as a, as a measure of inflation. In the case of Ethiopia, we find that these different, different baskets of inflation behave differently. So we distinguish between cereal, food, non-food, and then or the, the aggregate uh, index. So when we do, when we run the regression, we go to run regression to on the on the four on the four indicators. Um, because of again the nature of the economy, we take uh, literature has taken seriously the uh, the role of, of structural factors. So um, agriculture exposure exposure to, to, to imports and all. But what we found was that uh, in the in the existing literature, most of the focus has been on the demand side, because people are very interested in looking at whether, um, is it monetary policy that, that's fueling inflation? Is it the central bank paying too much money? Is the government growth? Uh, so in our approach, we want to not take a particular stance at the beginning when we say, yeah, inflation can be driven by any of those factors, and we're to, to just let it uh, tell us what's happening. Um, so, we model inflation in Ethiopia in internal and external factors. But to start with, as I said, we disaggregate inflation uh, into cereal, food, non food, and, uh, and overall inflation. Um, the, this graph shows you the trends of the various uh, uh, types of inflation. But I'm going to show you this one, which shows the uh, the case of non-food inflation and overall inflation. The non-food inflation is the is the red red one. In our when we started preliminary analysis, we couldn't explain non-food. No coefficient was coming. It's very smooth. It's very smooth. And it so happens that this inflation. Uh, this index includes uh, it includes uh, housing, water, electricity, gasoline, and other fuels. In Ethiopia, gasoline prices are very, very controlled. Uh, gasoline is subsidized. Our uh, benefit from the subsidy is and in, in, in Ethiopia. So um, it, it makes sense that this this index would not be as volatile as the others. And it so happens that that's the index that the central bank watches first. It's the one that guides their, their decision on inflation. So, uh, for those who have followed the, the debates in, in social media and all have heard about this debate uh, about controlling prices, following the ex, uh, excellent work done by, uh, by uh, our colleague Isabella, Isabella in her presentation, she said, no, I can't talk about controlling inflation, controlling prices. Yes, in reality, governments do control prices. And it's not in developing countries only. Does the US control prices? Yes. Wait, can the US let the, the price of corn go to the roof? No. The US, the US government watches agricultural prices. Of course, we can't call it control because it's in a Western country. The reality is that these indices behave differently because some of them, by nature, are considered so strategic by the government. The government actually uh, uh, controls them. Housing is the same. Uh, electricity is the same. Um, because because the electricity is that it's a state-owned uh, enterprises. So that, that justifies why you, should, you can't just take the overall inflation and run with it. To that. Um, the other is, uh, this is an example of why it's more to take, take into account structural factors. 
This graph shows you the trend of inflation around periods of drought, because Ethiopia has had episodes of drought, and they all have coincided with um, rising inflation in the, the, the old one. But another aspect of the structural features of the economy is its dependence on, on, on the rest of the world. And clearly you can see that when there's a drought, cereal production declines, they have to find cereals, so they import more cereals. Which means that they are hit by two shocks then you know, in terms of the inflation. So you have the, the drop in output, which is going to drive cereal prices up. But then they have to import cereal, which is going to be then uh, 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 bringing it with, uh, with the imported inflation. So that's another reason for considering the uh, uh, structural factors. So our inflation models will have demand side factors where we focus on the monetary factors and the, and the monetary factors and the, and the fiscal, fiscal factors. This should be the bullet structural factors, uh, which, which, which look at uh, the role of agriculture. And in this case, we, we simply look at the output gap, the serial output gap, as a measure of the shocks to, to output. Uh, then external factors, especially important uh, prices of, of, of food and grains and uh, non-food and oil. Uh, we, we are interested in how much in inflation dynamics, so we look at how much shocks to inflation last, so we look at dynamics uh, at, uh, at uh, the impact of that, that shocks, and then we pay attention to short run versus long run uh, effects using the core integration uh, analysis. Basically, the first step, um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll describe, describe the first steps in terms of uh, time series analysis. So the logic in, in, in this model is that inflation is driven by uh, disequilibria in key markets, so the money market, the fiscal, fiscal sector, and then external, external sectors. And we are interested in how those shocks uh, are transmitted in, in domestic inflation. Okay, so here's the, the building blocks of the model. Um, and I can tell you that we didn't start with this model. <laughs> you start, and then you oh, something is missing. So, the, but the baseline, that was because of the way we understand the economy. So happens that both of you combined the number of years in Ethiopia is a large number by time, both in Ethiopia, many, many years. And we have two Ethiopians on the, on, the, on the team. And so we actually have a sense of what are the key structures features of the economy. So we, our baseline is an inflation model that takes into account shocks to agriculture and shocks originating from the rest of the world. So as far as shocks to agriculture, as I said, it's measured by output gap, serial output gap, and then imported inflation, uh, the price of imported goods, and then the exchange. So that's the baseline. But then we say, yeah, we want to look at um, external effects, other external effects. So uh, this is driven by prices of goods which are prominent in, in, in Ethiopian trade. So grains, and non grains, oil, and so on. So here, what basically we are looking at is the relationship between the Ethiopian price and the external price. So, so purchasing power parity, basically, for, for particular goods. And then we look at how, uh, what the, the, the long run relationship between domestic prices and foreign prices, but also the transmission of shocks to, uh, to inflation in the short run. In the monetary sector, we are basically looking at the long run relationship between money supply and money demand and its drive, its, 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 its 
activities output uh, or income interest rate and then so this is a money demand function which is take into account income the interest rate and the exchange rate income and interest rate I don't have to explain but why the exchange rate in an open economy people are not just choosing between domestic currency and uh, domestic cash and bonds and whatever not cash uh, assets. They are also choosing between the domestic currency and the foreign currency. If the economy, if the, the domestic currency is, is seen to be losing value, people don't want to hold it. And I have seen, I know, see people actually sitting on on dollars because they think that the Burundian currency is going to depreciate. And I have seen that in Ethiopia. So that's what that's what our motivation for bringing in Asia. The problem is that empirically, when we look at the the behavior of the exchange rate, as you saw, the no, the official exchange rate is actually not changing very much. You see it's constant for a while, then it changes a little bit. 